we will uh, hope that it may warm up a little bit along the way here. Well, we are talking a little bit today about fishing. What do you call a lazy crawfish? A slobster. <laughs> What sort of music should you listen to while fishing? Some something catchy. <laughs> Why is fishing such a good business? It's the net profits. What do you call a fish that practices medicine? Be a sturgeon. <laughs> How many fishermen does it take to change a light bulb? It only takes one, but you should have seen the bulb. It was. What do you call a fish that won't shut up? That'd be a large mouth. Oh, here's the best one. What's the fastest fish in the lake? It would be a motor pike. <laughs> it's okay to boo. <coughs> Do we have any fishermen in here today? Fisher ladies? Oh, I see one back there. Do you know some good fishing knots? Good fishing knots? Do you know how to tie some good knots? Oh, that's a good deal then. Well, my sermon's called Fishing Knots. And today we are looking at some fishermen. We're just going to barely get into this a little bit. But we're looking at some fishermen and we're also looking at being tied to some things. Specifically tied to Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse number 18. It says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I'll send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. We have to acknowledge these disciples left everything to follow Jesus. They had indeed tied the knot, if you will. What plans and dreams and desires and hopes for their own futures had they left behind? Pretty much all of them. Whatever else they were tied to, they left behind as well. The things of life didn't take preeminence in their lives, but rather Jesus did. They were tied to Jesus from this point on. And we ourselves, we're tied to many things, aren't we? Some of them are good things, some of them are things we need to get rid of. These disciples were called to a very special ministry. And all of the followers of Jesus are also called disciples. Jesus should take first place in our lives as well, you know. Not prominence, but preeminence. He deserves first place in our lives. Sometimes... People are called to go to a foreign country and share the gospel. Some people are simply called to share it with their neighbors that live down at the end of their street. Which one are you? And how are you doing at it? Sometimes words are handy in spreading the gospel too. But today we're seeing several instances in Scripture of a few things Jesus said about following Him. As we look at Jesus' proclamations about following Him, we do see some oddities that just don't seem to fit real well with modern day church. 
a big crowd shows up in Luke chapter 14 at verse 26, and the disciples are just tickled to death. Tickled to death. We had a bunch of people show up, and we decided not to run the heat. So they would all go. <laughs> it's not real different from that. But they're all elated to see so many people, just like we would be. As we love to bring the gospel, we love to see attendance grow. And the attendance is probably one of my main barometers. Oh, I don't worry about the highs or the lows. I measure the bounce in between. But they're all elated over seeing such a large crowd, as are we. When we see it at a church service or a revival or a special event or anything else we've worked hard to put together, I bet all the kids up in Pigeon Forge are fired up to see all the fellow Christians there gathered together in one place. Resurrection often begins with the words, turn your phones off. Yeah. We can be tied to a lot of things, can't we? Any of y'all tied to the old telephone there? That's kind of a sign of our modern world, isn't it? But it's always heartwarming to see a great crowd at any kind of event. It's an opportunity to be fishers of men, or at least to cast the net out there. And a large crowd comes. Luke 14, 26, look what Jesus says to them. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yet, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, what are the disciples all thinking about this time? That's no way to fish. You're going to scare them all off. Maybe Jesus' definition of fishing is a little bit different than our modern world would put forth. These disciples must have been dismayed. No visitor cup or anything. Jesus just, do you suppose many left? And Jesus doesn't mean you're supposed to hate your father or mother here or your family or anything like that. But rather, it's to say you can lose an awful lot of things following Him. A lot of things you're tied to. Not only can you, but you will. And it's not to say you must hate their father or mother or wife or family. No, no, not at all. But they're saying your love for anything else is going to look like hate compared to your love for Jesus. That's pretty much the message. But still, yet, yeah, that's not a real swallowable message if you just see Jesus for the first time, is it? In our movie, God's Not Dead, number two, there was an Asian young man who accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And in the movie, in the movie, his father tells him, renounce your faith. And the son refuses to. And the father says, you are no longer my son and walks out the door. Such a sad, sad setting. Yeah, it can cost you. It always has. It always has. And that's what Jesus is talking about in this verse. You know, we read in the Bible about people being put out of the synagogue. And it's just a simple little sentence there say they put him out of the synagogue. We read on because we don't think anything about it. But do you realize that to be put out of the synagogue meant that your family was supposed to have a funeral for you? Do you realize nobody else was supposed to sell you anything or even speak with you after that point? Do you realize how drastic that is? That's what these people were facing that followed Jesus for the very first time. So he's not saying you must hate your family, but rather, you must love me a whole lot if you're going to follow me. Are we going to be tied to him or tied to a thousand other things? I saw a video the other day. This little dog, 
He had a rope in his mouth. And the other end of the rope went to a horse's halter. And the little dog was just so proud of himself as he marched around leading this horse, this huge but patient horse around. We don't have to look at that scene for long to determine that, well, maybe rather than the dog leading the horse, maybe the horse was walking the dog. It's hard to tell who was in control of this situation at first glance. At first glance. It's not going to take much for the little dog to let go if the going gets rough, I would say. Never tie yourself to a horse either. Oh, don't even double. I can remember I had a horse that was dumber than dirt years ago. and I took his halter, wrapped it around my hand a couple of times, you know, just to get a good grab on him. He liked to yank my arm out of my shoulder. I saw, I saw a story this week. This guy was riding about it not being a good idea to ever lasso a deer. Can you all picture that? He would feed his cows and these deer would come up and they'd about gotten tame around him, eating from the food that he was setting out. And he came up with this bright idea, he's going to lasso one of those deer, fatten it up, and eat it later on. So he sure enough lassoed the thing. He said, and it just stood there and looked at him. He wrapped the rope twice around his waist and had the tail of the rope here. You've got a good idea of what's about to happen, don't you? He said, it didn't move until I started taking the rope up. And he said, and then it exploded. <laughs> it exploded. He said, I learned several things. He said, I learned that pound for pound a deer is a whole lot stronger than a, than a horse or a cow or anything else. He said, and you can't get near that thing either. He said, it drug him and drug him. And he still maintained his composure and held on to the rope despite the blood that was running down his face where he wedged his head against a few rocks here and there slow down the deer's momentum. He didn't turn loose of the rope because he decided that, you know, that this rope situation may have been partially his fault too. And he didn't want the poor old deer to go off of the rope around his neck and die a slow death because of this situation. He said he learned several things. He said he finally got his rope, it drove him over by his vehicle and he's able to tie the rope off on his bumper. And uh, and he said, and that's where I learned that a deer could bite, too. <laughs> Poor old guy. He also learned that deer could fight with their front legs and their hoofs were sharp as well. I don't know how the guy finally got the rope off the deer, but he learned a few lessons that day, I do believe. You know, we've got to think about what we tie ourselves to. And Jesus is basically... Basically, saying to this crowd, are you sure? Are you sure you want to follow me? Are you sure you want to be tied to me? Because there's a lot that goes with this. Jesus goes on in verse 28 and compares it to building a tower. If a man's going to build a tower, would he not sit down and count the costs? You don't want to build the foundation and then find out that you don't have enough to complete the project. Otherwise, people walk by and they'll say, well, there's that half tower old George almost built. There he goes. Count the costs is what Jesus is saying to his disciples and to all the people there. In verse 31, he compares 
following him to a king going to war, won't he first sit down and consider if he can win the battle? You know, in the church we might be tempted to to say we offered this and that, a single ministry and all this stuff and a bear's wheel and the, you know, without ever saying you've got to take up your cross and follow Him. Jesus didn't pull an old switch, bait and switch. Have y'all ever heard of that? Yeah. Anybody of y'all ever caught in that before? Did you ever make your way down there to see yours because of the advertisement that was in the paper? To get that good deal that wasn't actually there? It was never there, was it? But they always had a very similar item at a little bit of a higher price. And since you were always there, yeah, that's what we call bait and switch. But Jesus does tell us about a treasure that's beyond what we can imagine. Any sacrifice you make to follow Him, you can't outgive Him. And you can't even compare the wonder of what He has for you. Are you tied to Him? Have you signed your name? They say that back at the time of the revolution, John Hancock, we all know that name, don't we? Sign your John Hancock here. And his is bigger than anybody. He wanted the King of England to be able to see his name without putting his glasses on. He, he was putting it down firm. And did you know, did you know that King George III offered amnesty to all who would cease fighting? John Hancock was among the select few who were left out of that offer. Oh, yeah. He had tied himself to the cause and it was evident to all, including the King of England. Some will get fired up but never, never really follow. I've known some who will decide they'll follow him but they decide they're not going to inconvenience themselves in any way whatsoever. You remember the man on the island? Rescued after two years. The Coast Guard came and got him. And when the Coast Guard guy said, what's that building? He said, oh, that's the hut that I built to live in. He's mighty proud of himself. Impressed, the Coast Guard captain said, well, what's that building over there on the desert island? He said, oh, that's my church. Well, well. The captain looked around a little further and he said, well, well what's that building over, over in the distance? There's another hut. And the guy said, oh, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> he wasn't tied real tightly to that church, was he? Wasn't tied very tightly at all. And if somebody offended him, there, guess who it was? It was he himself, was it not? How tightly are we tied to the King? How tightly are we tied? Mark 8, 34, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. <coughs> deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. How many items do you see there? Whoever wants to follow me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. I think there's four there. Might just see two. But first off is whoever wants. Whoever wants to follow me. You know, that's something the Holy Spirit puts in each of our hearts. He draws us to them. He calls us. We call it provenient grace. And, and some people compare it to 
Oh, you see people who want to go climb a mountain in Tibet looking for the answer. They don't even know what the question is, you know? But He draws us. We sing about it softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. Whoever wants to follow Me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Me. Some of the crowds just stare out of curiosity. Some remain in the crowd because that's what everybody else is doing. And for many in our world, the church can be just that. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself. That's cutting a whole lot of cords, isn't it? Must deny himself. You know, it's that old self thing gets us all in a mess, doesn't it? Somebody used to say, the devil made me do it. Well, it falls down to me pretty much making me do it. Ain't it that way with you too? I don't need the old devil to get me in trouble. I can keep myself in enough trouble as it is. My old friend Roger killed me. I don't know if I ever told you about him or not. Goodness gracious, what a mess. I haven't seen the guy in 40 years. He's passed away now. Poor old Roger. He, his mama told him that me and Nikki Stinnett got him in trouble. He got paddled about every other day. And Roger decided he wasn't going to sit with me and Nikki anymore. He told us that very frankly. And went back and sat in the back of the class. Now on this particular day, the teacher or something, for whatever reason, it's almost summertime, the teacher was there about halfway asleep at the desk in order that we all read you know what that was for, so the teacher could sleep. There in the back of the class, there was a fan running. They had the windows open, didn't have any air conditioning in the little school. And we were all sitting there quiet. Nobody was allowed to talk or anything, you know. We were all supposed to be reading. And all of a sudden, we hear this noise in the back of the class, and it goes, <laughs> And looked around, and Roger was trying to fish a piece of paper out of that fan back there, and he'd gotten his pencil caught in it. And you can imagine the racket. <clears throat> well, they took Roger out and paddled him again. He came back in, and he sat down with me and Nicky. I never will forget that. Look on his face. He was doing that crying thing where you do <laughs> And he said that. Uh, Mama said that, that you all get me in trouble, but she was wrong. <laughs> I get myself in trouble. He had come to that realization in life that it was his own doing. The same is true for us. We've got to deny ourselves as we follow Jesus. You know, as the years went on, I heard a little bit about Roger. He wouldn't have go to church. Heard that he passed away. First off, I'd read that he had had a son that had passed away before him. And the obituary was almost something that you'd read about in a comic book. Said the funeral procession was leaving from the VFW club that Roger's wife and I'm, I'm telling you all the truth about this. Don't think I'm making this up because I'm not. It announced in the paper that his wife and girlfriend were riding in the lead car. Roger's choices throughout his entire life didn't seem to ever get real high off the ground, if you know what I mean. And yet I can't help but wonder or is it always somebody else's fault? Maybe that lesson just didn't soak in. No need for church or God. That's probably the church's fault. Do you think? Just like our God on the desert island. Sometimes it boils down to self. And he says you've got to deny self. Don't let yourselves get offended easy over nothing. Nothing at all. 
We don't know what event it is till we lived in Jesus' day and saw what could happen to one of his followers. He says, we must take up our cross. And that cross is different for each and every one of us. It's something we choose to do. And he says, and you must follow me. And for the life of me, I never have been able to figure, figure it out, but that seems to be the place where most people fail. They have good intentions. They're willing to set self aside. And then, for whatever reason, they just never do follow. One day they're going to, though. One day they're going to turn their life around, is what they say. But the day never comes. And I'm left with that sad picture of a funeral procession. Hopes, dreams that never were fulfilled. Take up your cross. Follow me. Well, I'll tell you the secret. We talk about all these cords we're tied to, and we are all tied to them. We, we look at Jesus' words to us. Make sure you're able to build this tower before you start. The secret is, none of us are able to build it. We're all going to fall on our face. But He wants us to realize it beforehand because all things are possible when He's in the picture. And when we're tied to Him, He works miracles and He can do all things. And I'll leave this sermon today with a verse of Scripture that I believe is probably one of the saddest verses in Scripture. Listen to these words. John chapter 6 verse 6 6 that's not a real good number, is it? John 6, 6, 6. Listen to these words. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Boy, they put the appropriate number with that verse, didn't they? And that's probably one of the saddest verses in Scripture to me. And what had led to this, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I'll tell you, this is in 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll rise them up on the last day. He's got a plan for us. And I say to you, hold on tight. Hold on tight. Don't give Him prominence. Give him preeminence. He'll work with you. He's been known to work through the least likely of people, you know. Fishermen. And he'll make them fishermen as well. Because he's working on them and teaching them along the way. Let's pray together. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for every blessing. And we ask that you'd empower and enable us. Help us to keep our eyes upon you and hold tight to you as we, as we endure this journey we call life. Shine upon us and bless us. Show us how to reach out and make a difference in the lives around us. Be with us, we ask. And we ask this in Jesus' name and through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sorry for freezing y'all this day. Oh.